Hey everyone, and welcome back. I needed an excuse to put on some underwear and a t-shirt, so I figured I would go get myself on camera. And uh, if you're noticing right now that my skin seems a bit, I don't know, perhaps shiny, maybe moist, it's not what you think it is. I've begun a skincare routine to hopefully fix my gross pepperoni face. So uh, now that I've gone through this little opening rant, let's go ahead and get started. We'll talk about detecting concurrent rights, how we can do that, how this is better than last right wins, and uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and get into it so I can get myself to sleep. So if we recall where we left off from last time, basically I introduced the concept of multi-leader replication. So it means now that instead of just having to write to one place, we can actually write to a bunch of different places, which is really nice for increasing write throughput. At the same time, we run into the potential of write conflicts. So how can we actually address those conflicts? Well, one way is by giving every single write a timestamp, but timestamps aren't very reliable. So let's look at a potentially better way of doing so. So to introduce today's video, we're going to start with the concept of trying to build a distributed counter using a multi-leader replication setup. So like I mentioned, we've got our distributed counter. We've got two leaders right over here and over here. And the gist is that you know we've got one guy writing to our left leader doing increments. We've got another guy writing to our right leader also doing increments. So let's imagine we've got our version one over here. So in version one, the left guy has a count of three, the right guy has a count of five, and let's say now that uh, it gets to the point where they're sending their writes to one another so that they can actually you know, go ahead and confirm uh, the values that they have. So the left guy is gonna send three to the right, the right guy is gonna send five to the left. Well, how are they actually going to rectify these? How do we merge this write conflict? Because they both disagree on the value. Well, I guess one way that would be pretty simple would just be, hey, you know, five is a higher number than three. Probably there's just been two more writes that uh, we didn't account for on the left side just yet, and now we should set the left to five. You know, so we would do something like this. And, uh, you know, five basically just stays as five on the right because, you know, five is bigger than three. So in theory, that could work. However, in practice, it obviously doesn't. Why not? Because the guy on the left who is writing those three times to the left is different than the guy on the right who is writing five times. So the ideal result that we actually want to be getting is eight. That's the correct answer. So this should introduce ideally the concept of concurrent writes. Basically, we know that we have two people on the left and the right writing at the same time. They don't know about each other's writes, right? They haven't seen those writes before they're doing their own. And as a result, that's what makes them concurrent. You may have heard the term concurrent before, meaning two things happening at the same time, but truthfully, uh, you know, they can happen at slightly different times, but as long as they didn't know about each other, that is what makes them concurrent. So let's talk about version two, which I'm sure you are already starting to think about because example one was clearly pretty stupid, which is this concept of a version vector. So let's go ahead and talk about that as I zoom in this window. Pardon me. Okay, we're properly zoomed. So this time, instead of just storing a counter on each database, we're actually going to store the number of increments that we've seen from each leader node. So in the starting state, remember that we had a guy on the left writing three times, hence the version vector three comma zero. In the first index of this vector, we know that we've seen three increments to the left side and zero increments to the right side. Similarly, on the right side, we've had five increments. So now we've seen zero increments from the left side and five increments from the right side. Do recall that eventually these databases are gonna send their writes to one another. So when that happens, they can both send the actual counter value, but they can also send the version vector. So instead of literally just going and sending a naive counter, now we have this version vector and what we can do is merge them. So as you can see on both sides, it's going to result in a version vector of three and five and a counter of eight. Why? Because the left side has been incremented three times, the right side has been incremented five times, and so now we can just go ahead and combine those values, and the total counter is going to be the sum of the entries in that version vector. You know, eight is obviously equal to three plus five. So now what if uh, something were to happen where basically the left side gets incremented again? See over here, we've got one increment, and now the left side turns into nine, because we're incrementing our counter by one, and the left side has been updated four times, the right side, at least according to the left, has still only been updated five times. 
So eventually what's going to happen is that version vector of 4, 5 with a counter of 9 is going to be passed to the right side. And what we'll say is, okay, on the right, we now see that a counter of 9 is coming in. Are we just going to add 9 to our count of 8? No, we're not going to because that would give us 17 and that would be wrong. The truth is that this 9 and 8 have a significant amount of overlap. How much overlap do they have? Well, the 3 and the 5 themselves overlap. So the only difference is actually this 4 right here. So we're only just adding 1 to our version vector saying, okay, now we've seen one more increment from the left leader and now our counter is 9. Okay, so hopefully you guys are starting to get the concept of this, but the point is version vectors basically just keep track of how many increments they've seen from each leader database. Okay, so let's do a little bit of thought exercise now. How can we actually see which writes are concurrent by using version vectors? So let's imagine we've got these three leaders right here, right, L, 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 and they're in an all-to-all -all replication setup which keep in mind that means that any write can be sent to any node and it puts no guarantees on the ordering of when certain writes are getting to nodes within that replication. So notice now that we've got 212 over here on the top. What does that mean? It means that it's basically going ahead and seen two writes from our left leader, it's seen one write from the bottom guy, and it's seen two writes from itself. Okay. Now, what if you were basically getting past 111 from the bottom node, right? So it goes 111 all the way up here. We've got some write with some value and the version vector associated is 1, 1, 1. Well, basically what this guy would say is I'm going to disregard. We're not making any changes to this leader because we've already accounted for all of those writes. Why is that? Because 2, 1, 2 is strictly greater than or equal to 1, 1, 1, which means that we've already accounted for two writes in the first leader, one write in the second leader, and two writes in the third leader. So any write that comes to us by saying we've only accounted for one write in the first leader, one write in the second, and one write in the third, we've already accounted for all of those in our leader, and so we don't have to make any changes. So we know that a version vector where all of the entries are strictly greater than or equal to all of the entries of another version vector, we can say that the first write has come after the second write. They are not concurrent. On the other hand, if the opposite applies, we can say with certainty that those two writes are concurrent. For example, look at these over here. Five is greater than four, but two is less than three. And so what that means is that one of the servers has seen one more write than the other uh, that went to leader number one. But that same server has seen one less write from leader two, which means that these two writes could not have possibly known about each other. If you need to take a second, pause, think about this concept, but the gist is that if we have two basically interleaving version vectors, we know that those two writes could not have possibly known about each other. They must have been concurrent. And so what can we actually do when we realize that writes are concurrent? Well, let's think about it. Option one is to store siblings. So let's say I've got one guy over here who writes Jordan is scary, and then we've got a second guy on the left who writes Jordan is cute. So according to our version vectors, we know that uh, the version vector for Jordan equals cute is 1, 0. Why? Because there's been one write on the left side and zero writes on the right side, at least accounted for in this leader. And then similarly, the guy who writes Jordan equals scary has an associated version vector of 0, 1. Why? Because this database node hasn't seen any writes from leader 1, but it now has one write for itself. And so we look at these two things and we'll say, okay, well, 1, 0, and 0, 1. How do they compare? Well, in this case, 1 is greater than 0, but 0 is less than 1. So they must be concurrent. And if they're concurrent, that means that this is a right conflict. And so if it's a right conflict, what can we do? Well, we can actually store both rights in our database. That's known as storing the siblings. So an example of a database right here now would be the key is Jordan, but the value is either cute and or scary. I know, I'm both things. 
And so one way of actually kind of resolving this conflict is the next time that anyone makes a read from our databases, once they kind of combine and have both values, is you can actually offer the user a choice. Say, hey, wait a second, we see in the database that you know there are two different values. So do you choose cute or scary? And then once that value is chosen, we can now delete one of them. And now we've resolved our merge conflict. So that's one way of doing things is actually use the application layer and the user in order to manually resolve merge conflicts. Another one is actually to have the database do it automatically. So this is kind of the premise behind something known as CRDTs, or conflict-free replicated data types. So the premise here is that by effectively detecting concurrent writes, we can figure out a smart way to merge them. And so there are a few different types of data structures that we can build where we can actually basically make them write conflict resistant. One example would be a counter, which is effectively the same thing as a version vector, right? We saw the counter earlier in this video. You can build a counter that is conflict free because all you have to do is go ahead and merge those version vectors and now we have a counter. Similarly, you can do something like that with a set and possibly even more complicated data types. I'm going to leave this concept until next video, but so far at least I hope all of this has made sense. We've got one more tough one with the CRDTs and then we're going to go into leaderless replication.